Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's going to start this video talking a lot about language. I will get into this album, Chabrang by Serv Delitza. I will talk about how the music is both sad and engaging and kind of trip hoppy. I will talk about how it's amazingly produced, how it's brave without being showy, how it's experimental without being obnoxious about this great harmony of acoustic and electronic music, how it's haunting and ethereal and atmospheric. I'll get into all of those things. But first, you have to give me a chance to talk about language. Now, this actually happens to work quite well with this artist. Uh, her name is Sevda Litsa, but actually her full name is Sevda Ali Zada. She was born in Iran and lived in uh, Holland. She speaks Dutch and French and Portuguese and English and of course, Farsi, like her family from Iran. Apparently she is a prof professional basketball player. I don't know, she sounds like a very interesting person. But the reason that I was drawn to her album is not because of the rather striking album cover, which I will talk about soon, but it was actually because of the name Sevdaliza. That made me think somewhere in my mind, like where have I heard that term, Sevdaliza, Sevdaliza? And I thought it might have something to do that was something that I was shown by my wife. So I asked her, what, what is Sevdalitsa? And she said, do you mean Sevdalinka? I said, oh, what? Oh, right, Sevdalinka. Very close, right? Sevdalitsa, Sevdalinka. So Sevdalinka is a genre of Bosnian music, okay? If you don't know about Bosnia, it's an amazing place. Sarajevo is the most interesting city I have ever been, including Paris and New York City, an amazing place to go. But it's this kind of music that is like defined by its melancholy. Lots of piano, kind of mid-tempo music, music that sort of slows down and speeds up. And it's supposed to induce a feeling of melancholy, of sadness, of loss, of being in love, of losing the one that you love. It's all designed for this very specific emotion. It's a hard music to describe except by that emotion. And in fact, the word sevda is the key to the whole thing. The word sevda in Bosnian translates to a kind of sadness, a kind of melancholy. I remember listening to this music while driving. We just crossed the border from Serbia into Bosnia, driving along the Drina River and listening to it. And this is amazing. So I'm looking at my notes a lot. I have a lot of quotes here. I don't like to read a script, but I do have a lot of notes here. And this is amazing because this kind of Sevdalinka music, which can only truly be defined by the emotion that it incites, is so close to the way that Sevdalitsa herself describes her own music. It is hard to put her music into a genre, like indie pop, experimental indie, uh, I don't know what. But this is the way she describes it. I think my sound would be would mostly be described as pure and raw. I'm not necessarily drawn to a genre, but to a process, toward a certain mood like melancholy. Now, I have no idea if Sevdalitsa is familiar with Sevdalinka music. Certainly, one would assume she appears to be quite well-traveled, okay? But the crazy thing is, we're sitting there and we're thinking, well, why would a word from Bosnia have some kind of link to something in, in Iran? And then it all comes together. The word Sevda, and I'm now going to quote from, uh, from Wikipedia about Sevdalinka music. The word itself comes from the Turkish Sevda, which in turn derives from the Arabic word Sauda, meaning black bile. So it's just like bilious, right? Like we used to think that bad moods literally came from places in our stomachs, right? That's what we used to believe. In Ottoman Turkish, sevda does not simply mean black bile. It also refers to a state of being in love, and more specifically, to the intense and forlorn longing associated with lovesickness and unrequited love. This works well, I would say, both with sevdalinka music and with sevdalitsa's music that we are going to hear now. This is connected with the related Persian word Sevda, meaning both melancholic and enamored. It was these associations that came with the word when it was brought to Bosnia by the Ottomans. If you want to know what my family is like, you see behind me the Atlas of Languages. 
We were listening to this music, my son and my wife and I were all getting excited and we were looking up the history of these languages and how could this have possibly happened. So this feeling of sevda is the goal of this music. And I would say that if it's possible, that very disparate inspiration, right? I have no idea if Sevda Lisa has any inspiration from Sevda Linka music, but it very much has that same feeling. And it makes me think, you know, we listen to so much music for, you know, for emotional reasons, for to get pumped up, whatever it is, but to, def to, to reach for a feeling of melancholy is special. Like when you can have music that isn't just about being sad or about being depressed or about being angry or about being lustful, or about any of those things, but to have that sense of longing, of that kind of pain. It's not just sad. There's a kind of beauty in that sadness. And that's the, what you're going to hear in this album by Sebdalitza Shabrang. So let's talk more about it. It's, it's a very sort of alienating title, right? Like Shabrang, what does that mean? We're gonna to get to that in a second. As I said, it's a very interesting trip hoppy style album. The thing I would say it's closest to is Portishead. Speaking of music that makes you feel melancholic, but it's not quite as heavy in the trip hop, but it's more that her voice has a kind of shaky, faraway feeling. It's nice because the whole thing is produced by one person, you know, with her, another Dutch guy, Mucky. It's a funny name. Is that, I don't think that's a Dutch. Dutch word, mucky. So it's basically just two people making an album together and it feels really unified in that way. Uh, the lyrics are mostly about herself. It's about the sort of ambiguity about her place in her own life. But there's also a lot about sort of good and evil and Persian mythology and Old Testament and devils and angels. And even like this whole like sense of Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden comes back quite often. I wouldn't say it's an overtly feminist album, I wouldn't say it's an overtly political album, uh, but it has touches of all of those things at once. Mostly it's just one of these things where you just like want to know more about this person. Like, like wh what is her story? What, what is she talking about? And the whole album is just drenched in this wonderful feeling and this wonderful atmosphere that is consistent all the way through without getting boring. The first half of the album I would say is good. But the second half of the album is outstanding. And I think part of the reason why is that the second half, they get a little bit more experimental and they start doing things and they start playing with tempo a little bit more. They start playing more with this mixture of electronic and uh, organic instruments, acoustic instruments. But throughout, I would say that's the hallmark of the production is nothing is spared, but nothing is overdone. So if, if they need a kind of electronic blip bloop sound, that'll be put in. And if they need a violin, they'll get a violin. If they need a drum machine, they need a drum machine. If they need a drummer, they get a drummer. And they choose it very judiciously for this entire album. I am really excited about this. I'm gonna play of it, some of it for you soon. But I wanna kinda, of, I'm gonna lead up to the song I'm going to play. There's about five tracks on this album, which I like enough that I just wanna tell you all, run out and listen to it. But we'll start with the beginning. Joanna is the first track. Uh, very kind of extended voice, kind of ululating. I, I didn't want to be like, not racist, but I didn't want to just sort of assume like, well, she's Persian and this music reminds me of music that's sung in Arabic or music that's sung in Farsi that I've heard before, you know? I didn't just want to reduce this. But then I read uh, on Genius.com where she actually says that that is an intentional influence here. But she says it in a weird way. This is what she says. I see more and more influences that are naturally placed. If I had grown up listening to this type of music, then it would make more sense. But I didn't. It's just something that is inside me. So she very clearly is saying she wasn't listening to Persian music when she was growing up. That's not a part of her life. You know, we might have a stereotype of what her life is like. You know, my heritage is Scottish, right? But I didn't grow up listening to bagpipes, okay? <laughs> But maybe if I made an album, something would sound like a bagpipe. Probably my singing, unintentionally. So there is a little bit of that on this album. Like, you wouldn't listen to it and immediately go, aha, this person is clearly singing from a Persian tendency. No, but at times there's hints of it found throughout. But I do wonder if musical influence can be just hereditary, you know? like. If you left her alone in a room and said, make a song and never exposed her to any culture and never had her ever feel anything about her culture, would she inherently make music like that? Is there some kind of universal, I don't know. I'm, I'm not gonna talk, whatever that is, I don't have an answer for that here. Um, also, it's worth kind of talking about this cover. 
The cover is unpleasant. That's her, and she's got like a black eye. And in the research that I did, I do five minutes of research. I did a lot more because of the language thing. Sevda, Sevda, isn't that, isn't it cool? Can you please put in comments, Sky, it is cool, that the same word in Bosnian is the word in Farsi? Just what, what magic languages. Okay, um, but you know, in that research, it's just supposed to represent the trouble that she's gone through and the sort of perseverance. It's not a direct comment on, I don't know, domestic violence. I saw this and I assumed that this is gonna be a sort of extended meditation on domestic violence. Not at all, but it is about, personal, about perseverance. And it does have a lot of the nature of this album, right? Like, look at her face. She isn't sad, she isn't angry. You know, and she's wearing jewelry, so it's like a little bit fancy, but then she's also naked, so it's a little bit bare. And just that look, kind of determination. Apparently it has a lot to do with the next track, which is the title track, Shabrang. I don't know how to pronounce that. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize to those who know how to pronounce it correctly. This goes to the sort of larger theme. So there's the personal and there's the universal that she goes to a lot on this album. It's all about Persian history. And there was some figure, Siyavash, who had to, who was accused of rape and accused of doing terrible things. And he had to pass through a fire riding a stallion. The stallion's name was Shabran. And this is like this great moment of having to prove your innocence and prove your strength. I don't know. I don't fully get how it relates to this. I don't really get the mythology, but the song's amazing bass work. Great, delicate production. Uh, lots of kind of like, like the bass playing a lot, kind of like harmonics, you know, like the bring kind of weird sound. Very atmospheric, very solid. Next track, uh, Lamp Lady, is a little bit more guitar as opposed to bass here. The, the voice, she has a great range to her voice. She mostly does kind of acrobatics or kind of a smoky middle ground. This has that too. Uh, some kind of like good drums and some kind of trap drums at the same time. Uh, the theme seems to be about someone that she just saw selling tangerines. I don't know. All Rivers at Once. First of all, that title is great, right? If you're trying to imagine All Rivers at Once. The, okay, little experiment. Listen to the song All Rivers at Once and imagine all rivers can, like going to one place. That's kind of how the song sounds. It has this building and collapsing feeling that just goes all throughout. The drums are like almost jazzy, almost experimental, beeping electronic sounds, and then she just keeps singing over and over again, I don't wanna feel pain. She doesn't wanna feel pain, but she does want to communicate that sense of melancholy. The next track, for me, is the low point. Habibi, one of the few Arabic words I know what it means, like loved one. Uh, kind of tinkly piano, the super smoky voice, a lot of vocoder. Um, it, I don't like this one too much, but this is sort of the low point of the album and it just starts to go up from here. Dormant uh, has that most kind of high shaky voice. She really plays really well with this fragility of her voice. You know, like, like singers who can project shakiness and strength at the same time. That's just my favorite kind of singer. You know, whether it's Neil Young or this person. I just, I just love that ability to just be shaky and strong at the same time. The most electronics I hear here, uh, kind of Sade-ish even at times for her singing, although I've never really liked Sade that much. But she goes super up high. It actually ends up being a really catchy song by the end. And then things take off with the next track, Wallflower. This is where it really picks up. It begins with sort of like a poetry slam. It seems to be about herself being a wallflower. It sounds even kind of like, like a real drummer comes in. You know, he plays a couple times on this album. And it's nice because mostly drum machines, and I like drum machines, I love well-used drum machines, but just a great drummer comes in and plays some very well-played drums. I wish, I sort of wish he played on the whole album. Uh, next track, Gole B. Godun, is, and I had to look this up, a cover of a song by Gugush, who apparently is the world's most influential female Persian singer. I mean, a, you know, Iranian singer. I don't know, this is fine, you know, piano and violin, it's not bad, but it doesn't quite grab you like the rest of the album will. Darkest Hour, a super ominous track, kind of these oohs behind, it's about like being perfect and being in a dream, it turns out it's all about Adam and Eve and it's this, this like bass drum comes in, it almost sounds like a house track at some point, it sounds like an experimental house beat at some point. Cool stylistic break, very necessary for this album, I think because it was able to establish this mood, but I'm happy that it was able to go somewhere else. 
Then the next track, Oh My God, is almost a, it's almost like a pop song, almost out of nowhere here. Uh, kind of like a trap beat, and she changes up her voice. According to Genius, this is all about U.S.-Iran tensions and the tension between U.S. and the Middle East in general. And the lyrics are, Oh My God, Who Should I Be? What is it you want when you come for me? I'm an American. I have often thought about what it must be like to not be an American. And, you know, I, I am married to someone who's not an American, so I have some experience with this. Um, it must be interesting to constantly feel as though America wants something from you, from your country, but you don't know what it is. Like, what is it that you want when you come for me? I think that's a really really elegant way of expressing the powerlessness that the rest of the world must feel when under the foot or the hand or the fist of American military might. I'm going to try to remember that. That's a really well said line. Thank you, said Belitza. Then we get Eden, which has this absolutely insane, insane like keyboard lines that sound like tap bass and just these lyrics, like, I want to be your secret, or at least it's keeper. I want to be your pearl, or at least it's shell. I want to be the army, or at least the Trojan horse. I want to be the well, or at least the source. And I'm going to play you some of the song later on in the track. I can't, I can't do it. I am sorry. I can't play you, said the Litsa, and give you the right feeling. I'm only going to be playing 14 seconds of the song, so I don't get copyright striked, right? But you just have to listen to it. If the idea of listening to something that is capable of summarizing the feeling of melancholy in a way that leaves you satisfied and happy, just search out this album and listen to it. But here's 14 seconds of this. You can listen to the awesome kind of bass that's being played here. Here we go. Just a great song. And that's not even my favorite track on the album. My favorite track on the album is the next one. This might be the, the song of the year. I mean, truly, it might be my favorite song of the year. It's called Human Nature. It's not a cover of the Bjork song, but definitely, if you're sort of in a fan of like Bjork and Arca and these kind of like female experimental artists who are capable of making music that is very ethereal but engaging, this you'll like this. Um, it's just really intense usage of a vocoder, just the most intense. I mean, we were listening to this in the house. Uh, my son and I were playing Legend of Zelda together, and it uses this vocoder and just uses it so perfectly. I mean, so perfectly to hit these insanely high notes, and it melds so perfectly with her voice, because nothing's more powerful than when someone who doesn't need vocal enhancement uses vocal enhancement as an instrument, not as a crutch, but as an instrument. And oh, it just goes so high, and it's got this like down, it's like downbeat, hauntingly beautiful song. And then a, a violin comes in, and then amazing drum programming. That's the thing, Mucky. Whoever Mucky is, Mucky deserves respect for how Mucky does drums, because Mucky knows when to use a real drummer, and Mucky knows how to program a drum line. This is like master level drum programming. It is so good. Seriously, human nature. I'm gonna put a link to that down there. I'm also gonna put a link to an example of a Sevdalinka song, if you're curious. I'm, I'm gonna ask the Dr. And Mrs. Payne for a good example of a Sevdalinka song. She's probably, she's probably worried about picking the right one. I don't know. So those will both be in there. But just what a track, a true, true discovery. The next track, No Way. Uh, actually, the Dr. And Mrs. Payne said this is the closest to the Sevdalinka style because it has some piano, it kind of slows down and speeds up, and it has that great melancholic feel. The lyrics are, there's no way I can feel, there's no way this is real, there's no way for your heart to contain mine. There's no way for your heart to contain mine. Is that, is that a good lyric? Yes, it is. That, this is not going to be a new thing where I ask you. This isn't Dora the Explorer. But still, that's a very good lyric. And then another great track, like, oh my God, Eden, Human Nature, No Way. And then the next, you know, uh, Road is another great one, R-H-O-D-E. This is her voice at its most warbly. This sounds the most Portis heady, just in the way it's produced. It sounds like actual trip hop from the 90s. But then the real drummer is back in these lyrics. In a dream, I held a pair of scales, I stood my ground. And then all of a sudden, a sick guitar solo comes in. And it's by the same guy who plays drums. I'm gonna give him, I'm gonna shout out his name, Raven Artson. 
excellent player. I actually listened to some of his solo music after this, and that's good too. So maybe there's a lot of good stuff happening in Rotterdam. And despite Austin Powers 3, maybe, you know, maybe there's a lot of great, great things happening in Holland. And then the whole album ends with Comet, which is a very sad, forlorn song. Darling, the warmth that you spread is due to the cracks in your silhouette. Your shadow keeps them from the burn. Why don't they learn? You are a comet. And she's able to just sing this last line, you are a comet, melismatically over many, many notes, over many, many syllables and bars, goes up and down with it, and it's a perfect ending to this album. So there you go. There's my review of Seb Delitza's Chabrang. Uh, this is one which I'm definitely, it's actually gonna be a, a gift for my wife, because she heard it, she's like, Sky, I could actually see us listening to this. It's not, an, it's not an easy listen, it's not a first listen where you're gonna go, oh, I love this. It's, 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 gonna, it's gonna grow. But this is a really great artist, working with a really great artist, making a really great album. Okay, so for Billy Corgan and Albrecht Durer, there's the camera.